G'day, Rob from CDV here, and welcome to Outlander Studio PHEV. Well, it's been four years since I've had this car, so I thought it's about time I actually come around doing a video about it. What we like about it, what we hate about it, how it works, I guess the review, I suppose, after four years of ownership, and 84,000 kilometres. And also, too, we are selling this vehicle as well, so I thought I'd also make this video to help try and sell it as well, unfortunately. Not really unfortunately, we have placed an order for a Tesla Model 3 here in Australia, which should arrive in August according to the Tesla website. I don't know if that's Elon time or not, but yeah. So we got to August to sell this car. So I thought I'll finally get off my ass and do a video about it and show you all about and tell you everything about the Outlander PHEV. Okay, let's talk the most important thing when driving a PHEV or any type of hybrid, fuel economy. As I said earlier, I've had this car for four years. The first three years I've owned it, we lived approximately 10 kilometers from work. So I could do my entire daily commute to and from work and running around to the shops and things like that after work, well within the 40 kilometer EV ranges vehicle. Therefore, my fuel use over that period of time averaged 1.2 liters per 100 kilometers. Yes, just 1.2 liters, which is actually better than the book figures of 1.9. The book figures been here. Now, the last year of owning this vehicle, we've moved out here to Western Sydney. Now my daily commute is 80 kilometers. 40 kilometers each way exactly. And our fuel use in this time has now gone up to 3.5 litres per 100 kilometers, which as far as I'm concerned, considering I'm driving a mid-size SUV, five seats, five doors, and can tow, um, is actually pretty good. I don't think there's even a tire Prius in Australia that can get the fuel economy at 3.5 litres per 100 kilometers. Now, the other fuel economy figure that everybody likes to quote when giving their road tests, especially professional journalists and stuff like that, is the fuel use when the engine is running. Now when the vehicle is running in hybrid mode, as in when your battery hasn't been charged or the battery is dead flat, your fuel use will be around about between 6 and 7 litres per 100 kilometres, say 6.5 on average. And what annoys me is when these journalists road test these cars for a day or two, they drive around for three or 400 kilometres testing the car, they get a fuel figure of 6.5 litres per 100 kilometres, then I turn around and claim you're better off saving your money and buying a diesel because you're going to have a similar fuel economy. Well, straight up, that's just bullshit. I'll give you a good example. Now, we live in Sydney. Now, it's a 500 kilometre trip to the snow, which I would do regularly. Of course, outside the range of the battery by far. Now, on that trip, getting to the snow, we use 7 litres per 100 kilometres because it's uphill. And once you get to the snow, the fuel tank can be pretty low, so we refill it up when you get to the snow before we head home. So, we turn trip, we'll average six litres per hundred kilometres on the way home because it's downhill, mountains back to the Sydney. Now what happens is then, when I get home, we have, say, a quarter of a tank of fuel left, and the fuel average should be 6.5 litres per hundred kilometres. Now, for the next three weeks, I'll commute to work every day and not touch that remaining quarter of a tank of fuel, meaning when that fuel does eventually get used, the average fuel use will then probably be around about what we're getting of 1.2 litres per hundred kilometres. Well below what the journalists claim of 6.5 litres per 100 kilometres. So they never factor in the fact that when you get back home, you can just plug it in and start driving on electric only again, and which obviously greatly reduces your fuel use figures by a large margin. Now we have taken this vehicle out back, as in um, way out back, 3,000 kilometre round trip from Sydney into Cameron's Corner, miles into the desert. On that trip, on dirt road, the fuel economy will be around about 7.5 to 8 litres per 100 kilometres. Which again, for an SUV, loaded up with camping gear for five days worth of outback travel, on dirt roads, is still pretty good. Now, talk about the outback dirt roads, that brings me on to the next bit. How well does it drive? Extremely well for an SUV, I think. People say it has firm suspension, but I've never driven the petrol or diesel version of this to compare it to, but to me, I find it great. And also, the best thing about it is this is actually an AV, hence the word plug-in hybrid EV. Two electric motors, one at the front, one at the back, which means you have no gears, no gearbox, that sort of stuff, meaning smooth linear acceleration and smooth linear deceleration, which results in a lot smoother ride than any other petrol-powered or liquid-fueled-powered vehicle, which is great. Now, the firm suspension, a lot of people say it's too firm, I don't know, that's what professional journalists say, they drive more cars than I do, so maybe they're right, I don't know. To me, I like it, it's comfortable. The seats are especially comfortable. We have driven this car on 3,000 kilometre long road trips over five days, doing 1,000 kilometres a day at some time, and not once have I felt uncomfortable, sore butt, 
felt the need to constantly move around and reposition your butt to get the blood flowing for your legs and stuff like that. So the seat's very comfortable for long journeys sitting in the saddle, which is fantastic. When it comes to driving on those outback dirt roads though, this firm suspension actually comes into its own. Handles the bumps, especially corrugations. On the road to Cameron's Corner, like here, 90 kilometers an hour, 100 kilometers an hour, which is within speed limit out here. Handles beautifully. The stability control system controls the slides, decides where the drive's gonna to go to, does all the work for you. And it is just like driving down a, a you know, the gravelly highway, it's great. Handles really well. Okay, the drive system in this vehicle is unusual. As I said before, it's a PHEV, meaning it's a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. There's two electric motors, one at the front, one at the back. So essentially it's an all-wheel drive. But of course it's a plug-in hybrid, it has a two-liter petrol motor in the front, connected to a generator, which does, under some circumstances, drive the front wheels, which I'll explain shortly. Now, there's also a button here in the middle, which says twin motor four-wheel drive lock, which then forces the computer to deliver power evenly to the front and the rear motors, essentially giving you a four by four. Now, the petrol motor driving the front wheels only happens in certain circumstances. Normally when you have the um, battery in charge or save mode, which we'll get to shortly. Also, once the battery is flat, the motor can drive the front wheels at speeds above about 65 or 70 kilometers an hour. Now, what there is, is a little single gear between the flywheel of the engine and the differential on the front motor. And above those speeds, that flywheel, that little gear will then engage the motor, allowing the motor to drive the front wheels directly. So it's basically a petrol car front wheel drive car in that situation. Any excess battery power will then drive the rear wheels via the rear electric motor, meaning the car is still all wheel drive or four wheel drive. Freeway motoring and stuff like that, that one gear will drive most of the time, and you'll be essentially in front wheel drive mode on the freeway and hit the four wheel drive lock button, force the rear motor to drive. Now that brings me to the other modes, the charge mode and the save mode. Charge mode will force the engine to run constantly to charge the battery from anywhere to 80% full. Essentially it's a DC fast charger. It'll charge you from zero battery to 80% full in about 45 minutes if the car's sitting still. If you're driving, obviously more power is used to drive electric motors, so it takes longer to charge. Now, the save button I use quite a lot. What that does is save the battery charge at its current state. So if you're driving through town, you've got half a battery left and you hit the motorway, hit the charge button and the engine will come on and drive the vehicle, as well as maintaining the charge in the battery at that point in time. What the car will do is put a little bit of charge back in the battery, the motor will turn off and you will drive for another two or three kilometers on that. It'll be the charger motors of just, the engine is just put into the battery. Once that power has been depleted, back to where you set the, put the save button at, the motor will start again charge the battery up and drive the car again. So basically the engine's turning on and off, on and off, on and off all the time, maintaining a state of charge in the battery and also saving fuel. Another motor it has, which is by default, is when the battery runs low or it runs flat, the engine will start. It's essentially running in save mode anyway. The engine will start, you drive the car on petrol power via that single gear. If you're below 60 k's an hour, the engine will run, turning the generator, pumping power into the battery, which then goes to drive the wheels. So if you're below 60 k's an hour around town with the engine running, you're essentially like driving it diesel electric train, I guess. The engine's just producing electricity. It's not driving the wheels. Like the old Holden Volt, or should I say Chevy, Chevy Volt, did the same thing. The engine ran, turned the generator, charged the battery, which allowed you to drive. This does the same thing below 65 k's an hour. Above 65 k's an hour, as I said earlier, it will actually drive the front wheels. Now, on a long trip, say five or six, 700 kilometers, even longer, you'll find that when you check on the entertainment unit thingy here, total amount of EV distance driven, you'll probably be around about 40 to 50% EV driving using that system. So again, that's how you get your six liters per hundred kilometers out of a hybrid SUV. So yeah, it works really well. You don't have to think about it, you don't have to do anything. Just drive the car like a normal car. If you really want to, you can drive the car with never recharging it. That sort of defeats the point of having a plug-in. That's how the Toyotas work. You don't actually plug them in. The cars just charge up a very small battery to help you get offsets of lights, things like that. With this, we'll actually charge a battery to drive a significant distance electrical power only. So that's pretty much how the drive system works. Very easy, simple. If you want, just leave it, let the car do its thing. If you're like me, you like technology and gizmos and things, you can experiment with the charge mode, the save modes and all that sort of stuff and see if you can get the best economy you can. Next up, the best part of this car, the best feature I reckon this car has is the regen. I don't think any other EV maker has got this down as well as Mitsubishi has with this car. It is awesome. It is my most favorite feature, best thing ever. 
five stages of regen. B zero, which is zero regen, like I'm running now. Car is just coasting, not touching the throttle, not touching the brake. The car is just using gravity, which is the ultimate free energy, using some curvature of space time, just going downhill. No petrol, no electricity, fantastic. B5 is the strongest, which is not like um, Nissan Leaf and the Teslas and stuff like that. You can't use it to come to a complete stop, but it doesn't take long to get used to the timing to be able to judge the distance to let the regen do 99% of the work. Once you get to about 20 k's an hour, you need to use the friction brakes, but still, you've recovered a lot of energy. And in the, the stages in between one to four, I oh, tend to use them like going down the gears around, around corners, and especially like bearing hills and stuff on traffic. You can go down a hill coasting behind cars, and as they're on and off the brakes all the time, you can just keep adjusting your regen between say one, two, three, four, three, whatever you need to stay that car, recovering as much energy as possible and still keeping distance from the car in front. That is the best thing about this car. And also, the way it's activated too, is these two paddles here behind the steering wheel. Very easy, very easy to reach. They're mounted to the steering column itself, not the wheel, so they stay still, but they're long wide paddles, so they're still easy to access as you're driving and moving the wheel through your hands. It's, it's brilliant, it's perfect. The other way you can activate the regen is via the gear stick here. If you push back, it goes to B mode, straight to B3. Push back again, you go to straight to B5. If you put it in D mode, then Go straight to D mode, which is equivalent of B2. That's it. But to get it to regen to zero or coast mode or B, B0 mode, as I call it coasting, you need the paddles here. You hold the paddle down, it'll go straight back to D mode again, and then you tap it twice and you go back to one and then zero. That's it. That's the only niggling thing I don't like about the regen paddle system is there's no way of going directly to B0. Anyway, so that's the braking and the regen system of the Outlander PHEV. The best part of this car, in my opinion, by far. Okay, so I better get onto the car itself. Well, so may as well start from the front to the back. To the front, HID headlights. They're the ones with the arc. They don't actually have a filament. In this awesome, super bright, you see for miles up the road, nice bright white light and self-cleaning. This is cool. I've never actually seen that in action before. Interesting. Has fog lights. 55 watt halogens, I believe. Nothing special, just fog lights. High beam. Again, nothing to be proud of. It's just standard everyday high beam. Again, 55 watts. In the middle, the bonnet we have a two litre engine mounted east west as if it was a front wheel drive even though it sort of isn't but it's bolted to a big generator that's pretty much all there is to it that's it an engine and a generator not actually that complex as people keep saying but yeah it's just an engine and a generator and a single solenoid and the cog wheel that's it not that hard below that behind it is the front electric motor connected to the front axles simple really now inside the car entertainment unit is quite easy to use the best feature of this car has the scheduling of charging and climate control, which means you can preheat the car, you can pre-cool the car, which is great when it's one degree in the morning. The car's nice and toasty warm when I get to work and defogged. I can set it via my phone and the app, via the car's own Wi-Fi system, to pre-cool in the afternoon. Awesome. But the entertainment unit, yeah, is the same as the entertainment unit. They're pretty simple to use. Touch screen, which is good. Sat nav, crap, as they all are on most cars these days. I just use my phone. Bluetooth works brilliantly, easily connects to my phone for streaming Spotify or my own music. Two stage heated seats, mild and hot. Hot is awesome. In the mornings, combined with the preheat in the car in the mornings and the hot seats, the electrically heated seats, like the hot seats, they're awesome. I can get to work 40 k's without even touching the heater. That's how I managed to get 40 k's of range out of this car most times. Not using the air conditioner or not using the heaters because the car's pre-cooled and preheated. Behind me, three seats. Split fold rear seat, 60-40, as most cars are these days. Leather, nice. Centre armrest folds out, two cup holders, standards, crap. I don't sit back there, I don't care about it that much. I'm assuming they're comfortable, they look nice anyway. Behind that, being the PHEV, we have the storage area, baggage area, whatever you want to call it, the boot. Under that is a small baggage tray again, which I put all the charging stuff in, two side pockets on the side. Interestingly enough, there's two cup holders on top of the rear suspension mount. Because this is the PHEV, you don't get that third row back seat, you only have the five seats. So it seems strange having the um, two cup holders sitting there doing nothing. I suppose if you want to reach back and put a cup in it, you could, I guess. I don't know why you'd want to. That's pretty much it. The back, LED tail lights, LED brake lights, reversing lights are nice and bright, which is good. And you have a nice wide view reversing camera back there as well, which is great when you're reversing up the driveways and not hitting the bollards when you're reversing into charging bays. It comes in handy. Now what makes this interesting though, it is the base spec, it does have the Aspire options, as mentioned earlier, it has the leather seats, 
It has the heated seats, it has the Wi-Fi module, and the remote climate control. And all the options are only available on the Aspire. So I guess you could call this a unicorn car, I guess, maybe. We bought this car directly off Mitsubishi themselves. So it was an ex-demo car, ex-corporate car, with only about 10,000 Ks on it when we bought it. So maybe they optioned all this extra stuff in it, but I'm not complaining. That's about it, really, for the car. It is a 2016 model. It is a 2014 build. Every model of these in Australia was built in 2014, or 2014.5, but they were imported at different times. This particular one was one of the last to be imported of this shape and was first complied by Mitsubishi in Australia in 2016. Therefore, this is a 2016 model Outlander, PHEV, meaning the warranty period is from that date forward, not the date it was built. So it still has 2016, five year warranty, you know, a year or two left on the warranty. Awesome, so if you want to buy this vehicle off me, you can, it comes with factory warranty. As you know, it has been very well looked after, because I like looking after my cars, I spend a lot of money on them, I want to look after them. So I do the best as I can there. This car has treated me very well, has been the most reliable car I've ever owned. This car we've had from 10,000 k's to 84,000 kilometers, taken it twice to outback New South Wales, countless snow trips, non-stop commuting, not one single fault. Can't, you know, literally cannot fault this car. Nothing has gone wrong. Brakes, pads are 70% still there because of the regen braking force. Most braking is done using regen. And the way I drive it, I drive it, treat it like a game, try and get the most efficiency as I can and try not to use the brakes if at all possible. So that's about it. That is our Mitsubishi Outlander PHEV 2016 model. It is now for sale. So if you're interested in having a look at the car or wanting to buy it, send me a message below or send me an email. But the reason we're selling it is because we have a order now for a Tesla Model 3. So that is it. The PHEV, PEV, PHEV, however you want to call it. It's still an Outlander PHEV. The most popular plug-in hybrid SUV on the planet apparently, especially in Europe. So yeah, there you have it. So thank you for watching. If you're interested, as I said before, send a message. Yeah. So please drive safe and I'll see you later. Bye.